Welcome everyone to NAPCAN's um, NAIDOC Week webinar. I'm Lisa Waters. I am the Deputy CEO of NAPCAN. I'd like to start by acknowledging and paying my respects to the traditional custodians of the beautiful land where I'm today. I'm on Anawan country, but I'd also like to acknowledge the fellow nations of the Gumbangi, Kalmilaroi and Dungari, and pay my respects to elders past, present and future. I'd like to acknowledge all the elders past, present and future from all the lands that you might be watching from today and welcome all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are logged on today. It might be really nice to see in the chat function where you're logging on from, day, from today. So maybe on the right hand side of your screen in the chat function, you could share that information with us. It's also really important to acknowledge that children in these, the children in these communities because that's where culture will live on. NAPCAN is very fortunate to work across this beautiful nation and as part of that we're always very mindful of the devastating impacts of colonisation on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and their communities. NAIDOC Week is an opportunity to sit down and reflect on the value that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and culture bring to communities. What we know at NAPCAN working in prevention is that Indigenous people have understood the significance of the whole of community in caring for children for tens of thousands of years. For children to thrive, parents need to be supported. And this community aspect of raising children has been something that our First Nations peoples have been doing generation after generation. So with so many of us in lockdown and so many events unfortunately cancelled, we thought it would be really important to hold this webinar for NAIDOT Week and explore and celebrate two community owned initiatives that work well together and display these very concepts. It's so lovely to see so many of you logged on to hear about these initiatives with us. We're really looking forward to speaking to Carmel, Sherlene and Marley about the Girls Can Boys Can initiative, as well as Marley about the Family Community Summit that was held in Alice Springs. So a bit of an introduction, and I'm going to apologise in advance for my pronunciation if it's not, if it's not correct. Sherlene Campbell is an Aboriginal woman from Hoppy's Camp, Mungwatwa, Alice Springs. She's a mother of five and a grandmother of one. Shirlene is Walpuri, an Amanjira woman from her dad's side in Narente, and um, Laricha from her mother's side. Shirlene's been a leader at the Tanandjira Women's Family Safety Group since 2015 and was employed as a coordinator in 2017. In 2020, Shirlene was awarded the NT Local Hero Award in the Australia Day Awards. Shirling works um, from the grassroots to close the gap for Aboriginal people and is a strong advocate of two-way learning, which means sharing knowledge, stories and skills across all cultures so that we can all learn and value what each of us brings. Carmel Simpson has also um, has lived in Mumbatwa, Alice Springs for 12 years. Carmel's worked in Tanangira for nine years and as the coordinator of Tanangira Women's Family Safety Group alongside Shirling for five years. Carmel has huge passion for social justice and equality. Carmel's a full-time single parent of two boys and is passionate about supporting the upcoming generations to have an education and community that is working towards gender equality and social justice. Marley Wells has Walpuri and white Australian ancestry. She also grew up in Alice and studied at the University of Melbourne. Marley lived and worked in the UK before returning back to Alice Springs in 2019. And she's worked as the Aboriginal Education Officer in a primary school and as the coordinator of Larapinta Children and Family Centre. She's recently moved to the Family and Community Engagement Manager role for Connected Beginnings. And over the last few years, Marley has been a backbone member for the Child Friendly Alice. Marley is passionate about systems reform and equity to help every child grow and learn the way they deserve. So, um, before I throw to our speakers, I'd just like you to bear in mind that there will be time to ask questions at the end of each of the presentations. So please send them through via the question box on the right hand side of your screen. Um, if you can keep those coming as, um, as you think of them, that'd be great. And then I can put those to them at the end of their presentation. Alice is a really connected community and Marley incidentally was involved with the Girls Can Boys Can initiative. So she'll also be joining Shirlene and Cam. Carmel to speak about the initiative today. So I'm going to hand over to Shirlene. I'm going to welcome Shirlene Carmel Marley to speak about Boys Can, Girls Can. Girls Can, Boys Can, sorry. Good morning, everybody. I just want to welcome you here that we're all on um, 
well, where on our own country and just want to acknowledge that everybody else on your country, um, yeah, and the story that we want to share with you, Mob. Hi, and um, yeah, so I'm Carmel. I work with Shalane here in Mbantua Alice Springs. Um, and welcome to this NAPCAN Night of Wake event. Um, and Marley, did you want to say hello? Hi, everyone. Um, <laughs> I feel like I'm going to take a bit of a back seat in this presentation, but have been involved since the beginning. So looking forward to seeing what you've done. Thank you. So um, we just want to go to the first slide um, after this, um, and we're going to do uh, a little bit of an acknowledgement of country that we use within our Girls Can, Boys Can country, uh, Girls Can, Boys Can project. Um, so we would like to acknowledge uh, that today we meet on what always was and always will be Aboriginal land, the land of the island people here in Mbantua Alice Springs. We also acknowledge that the country we now call Australia was built on the stolen lands of hundreds of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations, each with their own unique language, culture and traditions, and that sovereignty was never ceded. It is important for those of us who are not First Nations people to this country to recognise that we are working on stolen country and benefiting from systems that are still displacing, disadvantaging and discriminating against First Nations people. Telling the truth or truth telling is about, about this country's history, not only acknowledges the colonial violence and dispossession, but also acknowledges the more than 65,000 year history of the oldest continuing cultures on earth and the strengths, resilience and knowledge, skills and lived experience of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. We would like to pay respects to the ongoing spiritual and cultural connections to the land and country held by traditional owners and custodians of Mbantua and pay our respects to elders present and emerging and extend our recognition to their descendants who are present. So we like to have this acknowledgement from the non-First Nations people in this project to acknowledge all of that history as well. We can move to the next slide. Uh, I'll talk about the next slide, the Tungandjura and Bantua Council, um, Alice Springs background. Uh, Tungandjura is uh, our under word and it's translated into English means working together. Um, Tungandjura Council was incorporated in 1979. Um, that was built from the foundations of two old elders, um, male elders, uh, lawmen. Um, and yeah, the need for that was, I guess, for um, Aboriginals needing to have that kind of balance as the white Western world as well. So we're kind of was slowly stepping into that because it was all about equal rights back then. Um, Tungandjura Housing Association has 16 town camps communities um, that makes up the board of Tungandjura Executive Councils. Tungandjura is a primary service for Alice Springs 16 town camp of Alice Springs. We have the employment services, uh, we have family, um, youth and children's services. We also have our own bank. We have return to country. Um, we help our people back to country, um, whether if they need fuel or vehicles. So, you know, we're always not leaving anybody out in the cold. Um, we also have an ID services. Uh, and also the emergency relief. Emergency relief is like if they're wanting to get IDs or food, food vouchers and you know, emergency relief like going back to country as well. Uh, we also have the finance and an executive offices. And also have the community safety and the social service divisions that we sit under as well. Yeah, so on the next slide, um, we've also got a little bit about the project and the program that we work with. Um, so the program that we come under is the Tungajira Family Violence Prevention Program. Um, and Shirlene's just going to tell you a little bit about each of those projects. Firstly, the Tungajira Men's Behavioural Change. What that one is, I guess, is for men who are using violence um, and wanting to make that change within themselves. Um, the Men's Behavioural Change is making a change within the way of men using violence within themselves and, um, I guess, making them accountable for their actions and making sure that their family comes first within themselves. 
On the bottom of the men's behavioural change, we have the men's outreach and referral services. What that one is, is for when men are coming in and out of course or coming out of prison, um, they tend to go to the men's uh, outreach assessment referral service. Um, with that one, I guess, is where we're wanting to try and to keep our people out of the prison system and getting them into um, uh, services like ours, um, I guess, and other services out there. Um, just to getting them the help, like I said, you know, keeping them out of prison, making them think, um, you know, think about what they've done for their actions against families and, you know, women and children. We also have the Tanganyira Women's Family Safety Group and what we are, we are the blanket of the program. We are the advocates, um, we are the influence and the voices, I guess, I don't really, I'm, been thinking about this last night and using voices is that I want to echo other people, other women's voices as well by using my voice, um, hearing and, you know, uh, the work that we do, um, making sure they're safe in their community communities. We build a lot of resources, um, posters, uh, short films. We've done a lot, so yeah, I'm just, yeah, I don't know where to start. We've done a lot of social media stuff, um, advocating as well, um, not just for women, but for children as well. Um, and then we also have the Domestic Violence Specialist Children's Services. What that one is, is that when you, as you see now in our society, is that our young ones are using violence now. Um, I don't like using the terms of what I want to say, but I have to say it because when I do say it, it kind of opens up people's eyes. So using the terms of babies, having babies, that we want to break that cycle. These are young ones that we need to educate and we need to walk, walk alongside them as well because they can see their future and they can also see their vision. We need to start understanding and listening and adapting into their worlds because really as adults, we have a little inner person in ourselves as well. Yeah, so the Tanganjira Family Violence Prevention Program started off with just the Men's Behaviour Change Program and very quickly they realised that they needed the voices and the stories of Aboriginal women from Alice Springs um, to really uh, value what experience Aboriginal women had here and a lot of the men in the Men's Behaviour Change Program originally were referred in by Women's Family Safety Group members uh, and from their families. So what we have with the Family Violence Prevention Program is really um, a cross-community uh, cross approach. And the Men's Behaviour Change, for example, is really that response end of family violence. So the violence has already happened and it's trying to intervene at that point. Um, the Domestic Violence Specialist Children's Service is case management and it's that early intervention Stage. So there has been experience of violence um, and trying to intervene at that point. And then the Tanganjira Women's Family Safety Group is really this primary prevention approach. So like Shirlene was saying, it's all of this messaging um, around stopping violence before it begins. Uh, and so this has been the really successful part about this project. It's not about case management, but it's about really amplifying the voices of Aboriginal women in the area of talking about family violence and preventing violence as well. Um, so if we go to the next slide, we'll actually just share with you uh, some of the projects that the Family Violence Prevention Program have been doing, which are these primary prevention uh, projects about um, stopping violence before it begins. Um, Shirley, did you want to talk a bit about the Mums Can, Dads Can project and what that was about? Yeah, yeah. Um, Mums Can, Dads Can is, is a primary prevention program. With that one is uh, flipping that wicked gender stereotype role within the household. Um, with creating Mums Can, Dads Can is that, you know, we wanted to um, build uh, real opportunities for people out there to, you know, be that community, um, I guess, engagement to be a part of the work that we do as a Tongue and Jira Women's Family Safety Group. And it's also um, getting men to actually understand, you know, we're not that we're not the only one that's got to do all the household chores. Um, it's all about equal roles. Men can do the same, women can do the same. And by doing that, kids can understand how relationships are connected and how it is in a healthy way of um, growing up children as well. Yeah, so this project um, started a couple of years ago 
and it was really uh, adopted and really um, yeah really taken on board in the community people really loved it but not only in in Mbantua Alice Springs but all over Australia and even internationally people have really loved this project because it's really strength-based um, it's really allowing some freedom uh, for people to feel like swapping those gendered stereotypes, those really rigid gender roles in parenting. People really talked about how that gave them a sense of freedom to be able to try these other roles. So um, one of our most popular uh, posters was this dads can be gentle. Um, and we would always flip that with um, a poster for mums as well. So mums can be strong. What we really found, it was really tricky for us to find roles and more uh, posters for the mums than it was for dads because we know that there were a lot of women with gender inequality doing a lot of the roles within the household and, and doing all of those other roles as well. So some of our other posters really led towards, you know, mums taking a break and mums going out with friends and mums doing things for themselves as well. So um, people really enjoyed it. It really just started conversations and, you know, we'd go to community events and people would say, oh, this happens in my household or, oh, that wouldn't happen there. And it just really starts a nice conversation. And that's what these projects are really about. And it's also happening in the communities as well, because when I tend to talk in with my people out in the communities about, oh, do you understand what dads can, uh, mums can, dads can? And they're like, oh, no, we know a little bit, but tell us more. And when I tell them, it's about flipping that rigid gender stereotype role. And when I talk about, oh, you remember the old old ways, you know, the old where our ancestors were used to live, they had equal roles. Yes, men had roles and women had roles, but they were equally working as families as well. So. I, they're kind of wanting to get on board as well and communities out, are surrounding other springs are also calling out for the posters that we've developed and I guess that um, yeah for me passionately I want to see more Aboriginal people working on gender uh, gender inequality in communities um, because that can start conversation and it's kind of interactive and exciting way to build a uh, healthy way of a um, relationship. And, and girls, a safe community. Yeah, and Girls Can, Boys Can came off the back of the success of Mums Can, Dads Can. Um, and we'll tell you a little bit about that project um, after this. But what we want to do is just go to the next slide and just really explain uh, what primary prevention of violence against women is. So what we really have done with these projects is linked the research to practice, but also have the cultural elements and advice from Tungandjira and the Tungandjira Women's Family Safety Group and the Men's Family Safety Group. So primary prevention of violence against women is really that idea about stopping violence before it begins. So this is intergenerational change and it's change in attitudes and beliefs that allow gender inequality and violence against women and children to continue. So when we're talking about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and children, we're also talking about those attitudes and beliefs that allow racial inequality and violence against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and women to continue. So to stop violence before it begins, children really need to see and hear gender equal messages and hear respectful relationships between girls and boys and women and men. So as adults, what we figured out that we needed to do when we originally started this project um, with Girls Can, Boys Can and talking to the Larapinta Child and Family Centre team, we thought we would create a few posters and some books and resources and really teach children about um, gender equality. But what we realised is that children are learning what we are providing for them as adults. And so we have to, as adults, really unlearn and become more conscious of that hidden curriculum of gender inequality that we're teaching or demonstrating to children. And that's going to assist children in, in addressing these key drivers of violence against women. So also the other component is that when we engage in truth telling about our shared history of ongoing colonisation, um, which is why our acknowledgement of country is as it is, um, and we also use strength-based messages from Aboriginal leaders and celebrate Aboriginal families, children and culture, then we're addressing the other key drivers of violence against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women. And if we go to the next slide, there's actually a, a diagram that we have adapted from our watch um, with permission. And this is about the key drivers or the leading causes of violence against women. So for all women, women are more likely to experience family 
domestic and sexual violence in their lifetime than men. And Aboriginal women are more likely to experience violence than non-Indigenous women. So the key drivers for, or the leading causes of violence against all women are those gendered factors. So they are the things that we talked about, that gender inequality, those rigid gender stereotypes. So for all women around the world, this is one of the key, key reasons or the leading causes of violence against women. For Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, there are the ongoing impacts of colonisation for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's families and communities. So that's the impact of colonisation. This is stolen generation. Um, this is intergenerational trauma. So those impacts mean that Aboriginal women are more likely to experience violence. And there's also the impacts of colonisation for non-Indigenous people um, and society. So what our watch identified was that those are things like racism um, and systemic inequalities and attitudes and beliefs around uh, violence and, and Aboriginal women experiencing violence that may stop people, for example, reporting that violence. So we, within this Girls Can, Boys Can project, are looking at addressing all of the key drivers of violence against women to try and prevent violence before it begins. Um, so if we go to the next slide, we wanted to talk about, well, how does this relate to Girls Can, Boys Can? So um, we started, as we said, working with Marley's team when Marley was working with Larapinta Child and Family Centre. And we started working as a team looking at um, that studies have shown that by the age, by the time a child gets to preschool, they have an understanding of gender, gender expectations and gender limitations. So they also understand there are gender roles and stereotypes, um, and these often in influence the way that boys and girls um, experience life and how they play. Also language used by um, children uh, lets us know what's normal and acceptable for different genders. Um, and children are learning from the unconscious examples and relationships and the roles that adults provide. For Aboriginal children as well, they're less likely than other children to see books and stories where they can see themselves represented. So, um, Marley, you uh, have been involved in this project from the start, and um, we've also asked you now that in your new role to be involved in uh, helping us write the book for Girls Can, Boys Can. Do you want to just talk a little bit about the process that we've gone through in writing the book and what it was like working so far with the Tungajira Women's Family Safety Group on this project? Yeah, absolutely. So I think as part of the Larapinta Child and Family Centre, what was really um, interesting and amazing for us to see is that while working with a lot of people who really were facing complex challenges, this is something that they, that everybody felt that they could grasp and be a part of, and also that the kids were happy to be involved. So. The little picture that you can see on the screen um, with the fairy wings, like that's the sort of dress ups that are at the centre and that all of the children are happy to play with. But we do know that by the time those children get to school, you know, the boys are less likely to be wearing tutus. Um, and that with the whole community of Larapinta Child and Family Centre being able to recognise um, what gender stereotypes do for children, that everybody there was willing to open up about their expectations and their visions of what kids were able to do. So that was really nice to see. Um, and being involved with the women's safety group, so we started off, I think, going to workshops with you to begin with. And then we we're part of learning how to do um, some surveys with the Equality Institute. So that was just to get some opinions. I'm sure you'll talk about this further, um, just to get some opinions about what people really think in Alice Springs and what um, what people's opinions of Aboriginal sort of culture and violence and all different things are and um, so yeah just to be involved from the beginning and to see this really progress has been so amazing and so meaningful. Yeah thanks Marley. Thank um, it really has been a really wonderful partnership and I think what we we worked with a whole lot of the families at Larapinta Child and Family Centre and we talked a lot about, you know, what what it means when little boys, for example, are really told in these um, unconscious ways that what it is to be a little boy and to be a man is to not cry, 
um, not show your emotions, not be expressive of yourself. This really limits the way that little boys can become men and their experiences in life later on. And what we talk a lot about with parents is that when little boys are told, don't cry, grow up, be a man, um, push those feelings down, then you end up with a generation of men who are not comfortable sharing their feelings, not comfortable in crying, and can also express their feelings and emotions in, you know, in anger. Um, and so that gender inequality really has an impact on men as well as women and girls. Um, and so for women and girls as well, some of those really strong, rigid roles that we're looking at in, in schools, the more and more we look into this, is that you know little girls are often um, told and praised for being quiet and being compliant um, and you know and also really nurtured into um, in fulfilling these roles as carers and you know while these are also wonderful roles it also does limit women to and, and men and boys as well um, further down the track, it seems like women and girls are really streamlined into these carer roles um, that, you know, then we're told that women are just naturally better at these roles than men, which we know is not the case. It's just that we've been conditioned from such a young age that this is what we do. Um, and so what we're really realising with all of the language and everything that we use with children, um, that while we think that some of these things might be, oh, what's the real problem with, with these messages? Um, they do have really big implications down the track for the way that these young children then see that it is to, what it's like to be an adult. And those limitations as well um, is something now that we're working with the schools to try and look at how we can integrate some of this stuff into the early learning curriculum space um, and also into messages as well. So we go into the next slide. Um, what we did with both the Mums Can, Dads Can and the Girls Can, Boys Can project. Mums Can, Dads Can, we really had messages, posters, merchandise, animation, and it was about challenging those rigid gendered roles within parenting to create more equality. Um, what the Girls Can, Boys Can project wants to do is to develop resources that are promoting gender equality. Um, within the resources that go out to the schools, we're not necessarily drawing the link between violence and gender inequality, but we're using, you know, images like the little boy here uh, with the fairy wings and the tutu and the hat is actually a little, um, a representation of a little boy that was at Larapinta Child and Family Centre the day that we were doing a chalk art workshop um, and his mum was very happy for us to, to use him as sort of our model for this, this project. Um, and Sherlene and Marley will be working on writing a children's book for Girls Can, Boys Can with our two characters, um, Cody and Casey, who were in the previous slides. Um, we're also looking at developing culturally safe and inclusive and celebratory messages and images for Aboriginal children and families. Um, and then working with parents and educators. So we will develop a toolkit of resources, uh, cards, books, merchandise, training and audit so that um, different groups within this classroom can really reflect on the language and the spaces that they have created um, and the messages that we provide for children and then also lesson plans as well. Um, so if you go to the next slide, something that we often say when we're working with people is that we know that you can't like all of this stuff is important, but you can't walk through water and not get wet. So what that really means is that we're all swimming in these messages from a very early age and really unconsciously as well. Um, and so it's, it's something that we have to really become conscious of to really change. And it's something that we're really challenged with each other that we have to keep thinking, oh, that's something that I do. And I think normalizing that it's there's nothing wrong with, um, you know, we've all been doing this stuff for so long and we're not trying to shame anybody um, when we start using language that's not inclusive, but it's just about that awareness. And when we start having that awareness, then we can't unsee um, what we know. Uh, so we really are wanting to make sure that um, Girls Can, Boys Can just builds on the success of the Mums Can, Dads Can project. Um, and it's about, you know, using uh, the research that we had from our watch to really change um, change all of this work intergenerationally as well. 
Um, so, yeah, did you want to talk any more about Girls Can, Boys Can with, um, with the Women's Family Safety Group and what we've been doing with them to develop the books and the resources? Um, not at this moment, I've been clouding now. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, this is really just about, you know, challenging those ideas about the traditional roles of women and um, men and girls and boys and about that intergenerational change. What we know though is that our project is such a little project and this is only one part of primary prevention. But if we look at some of the bigger campaigns that have been successful in primary prevention and we look at say the example of the anti-smoking campaigns you know these things started in in the 80s and you had um, messages that were about anti-smoking you had GPs that were working there you had um, limitations on what advertising people could use there was also legislation brought in and what we've seen is over the last 30 or 40 years is that there's been a change in attitudes and beliefs about smoking and less people taking up smoking and it's not as culturally acceptable um, for people to smoke. Um, and so when we're talking about primary prevention in family violence, we need a whole of community change like this, but we need the investment from government to really um, make this a priority and really fund these projects. So we're very, um, very thankful that we have funding through the Northern Territory government um, and if we go into the next slide, we can talk a little bit about uh, that there's actually through the Safe Perspective Free From Violence Prevention Fund that we have money to run these projects. Um, but really as one little project, it needs to be a whole of government approach um, and cross sector approach. And while we're working with the education department now, we really see that you know, we could work with health and other departments down the track and through a whole lot of different sectors because violence against women shouldn't just be about uh, the responsibility of the primary prevention sector for violence. They really should go across all of those different sectors. Um, so as Marley mentioned as well, this project, which we're really excited about, has been independently evaluated by the Equality Institute with funding from ANRO, so the Australian National Research Organisation for Women's Safety. So in about October, we will actually have some really interesting data which has never been uh, researched before about attitudes and beliefs around violence and how this project so far has influenced some of that um, change of behaviours. Um, so uh, I think we probably should leave it there. We've probably gone over time um, for then Marley to talk about her project but um, we just want to say a special thank you as well. Um, to all of our community champions. And this is a big idea for us, is to really get so many people involved in this project um, across the community. So- um, Because it's everybody's business. And yeah, like I always say, um, you know, we wake up every day looking at our kids and that's our reminding there, looking at our kids, I guess, two-way learning and deep listening. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Oh, um, I'm back. Thank you. That was really inspiring. And um, we've got a number of questions coming in from the audience, but no more than how can we get our hands on these resources? I know it's a question that I've asked you all, but I, maybe you might want to outline the difference between mums can, dads can, and girls can, and boys can, and how people can access those resources. Or they can go to Alice to the night markets, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I'll hand yeah. over to you. <laughs> so, yeah. Head over to our, our webpage, the Chungandjira um, Family Violence Prevention page. There's a donation button there. You can head to that one and donate on that. Or you can go to our Facebook page and there's a link also on that as well, is there? Yeah. 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 And then in terms of the Girls Can, Boys Can, Mums Can, Dads Can resources, we've got a lot of our posters for both of those projects. One of them, uh, the Mums Can Dads Can project is on our Tunganjira Family Violence Prevention Program website. Um, on the Tunganjira website, there is links for the posters for Girls Can, Boys Can. Um, and keep an eye out for that. We're going to do more um, posters with more messaging once um, Shirlene and Marley's book develops as well. And you also might. Um might be a good uh, project that we've also done to Always Are Strong. So that's another one. So that's kind of linking to what 
the um, mum skin, dad skin, and girls skin, boys skin. So I guess that's a grassroots, um, yeah, that's yeah. rising up. Yeah. I think also what's really great with the t-shirts particularly is they open up a conversation. Like people, when I wear any of my shirts that I've got, um, people really ask you what the messaging is and, you know, um, kids thrive when they're free to be whoever they want to be. It's such a simple message, but it's really deep. And so you can create these big discussions with it. And it's so easy for people to then take that on and talk to their family and friends about it. Um, so the reach, the potential is so big. Yeah. And at the moment we're but, printing in Alice Springs. Um, we don't have capacity at this stage to send these. We don't have a shop. There's Shirley and myself in our team. Uh, so we are selling some of the night markets and, and giving them away in, in our community as well, because that's the real idea of primary prevention is to give them away. We are developing toolkits, um, which will be for schools in the Northern Territory, which we're hoping we have enough funding to just hand those out to schools in the Northern Territory with training as well so that they can, can be used in the right way. Um, and then down the track, if we have capacity, we would love to expand this out. Obviously, it's very uh, place-based, so it's been developed with Alice Springs in mind, but I think it could be very transferable all around the place as well. If I'm um, just looking at the comments, people are really engaged and like, wow, this is such a great initiative. And I, I think it's uh, and uh, why it resonates so well with so many people is because we've all got a, a part to play in it. We can all see a role in it in the community um, aspect. Like we can all fit in challenging some of those conversations and those attitudes and beliefs. So lots of lots and lots of questions around that. One of the questions um, that came in was, just wondering how the mum can dad can project is perceived with the elders. Are the role changes something of concern to them or do they encourage the gender equality? They encourage the gender inequality. Gender equality. Yeah, because it's all about always as strong. So when you look at it, um, like Carmel said, six, 65,000 years ago, we've already had those roles and we were working equally in a, in a kind of, a, I get, guess in a healthy, vibrant way out in the communities and out in the bush as well. Yeah. And we have to recognise yeah. as well that um, colonisation really has had an impact and that's that influence from non-Indigenous um, communities uh, where, you know, that those patriarchal views about the roles of women and men being unequal have come across from colonised um, society and culture. So when we actually have had some older women, when we've done Mums Can, Dads Can workshops, um, we had an older woman uh, do a workshop with us at Walpre Camp. And at first she would say, no, 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 these are men's roles and women's roles. And then she went, actually, no, he can clean. Like she was about 90 year old woman. Yes. No, he should clean. And, and it was almost like this light bulb, like she'd never been given permission to um, think a different way. And yeah, she really just, hit her and she was like, yeah, no, actually that that's good. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. So it's good to have that conversation too, because you've got to kind of remind these old people as well, you know, think about the history. I mean, not that's the broad drama kind of history, but think about the happy times that you've had. So reflecting on the good memories, bringing those into this society today and getting our elders to walk alongside us, for us women to be the voices and for us women to be, I guess, to be the blanket of our children, to I guess um, push them and support them again for their visions and ideas. So along with many other questions, there's one in capital letters that says, you're all amazing, thank you. Um, so with that, I am going to have to say goodbye to um, to Carmel and Charlene um, at the moment and introduce Marley's initiative, but thank you very much for your time. Um, okay, and I also want to um, just outline that Charlene's been a friend of NatCam for years and has produced the artwork for three of our National Child Protection Week posters and one of our colouring posters over the last few years. You may have seen them if you've been involved in our National Child Protection Week campaigns. Um, we've been very fortunate to be able to work with Shirlene and have her develop and relay messages about keeping children safe through her artwork and, um, and have be able to utilise them for our campaigns. You'll see in the chat function a link to um, this year's National Child Protection Week poster. It may not be online and they, you may not be able to order them, 
until Monday. Um, we're not sure if it'll be up on the website today. This year's poster is about deep listening and it was developed from another program that NAPCAM was fortunate enough to work on in the NT and Sherling was also part of that. Um, it's called Stronger Communities for Children. If you want to hear more about that, um, we'll put NAPCAN's NT manager, Marion Looney, and Queensland's manager, Sammy Bruderer, details in the chat so that you can um, ha have a look at that. We'll discuss that with them. Um, we were lucky to work with Sherling on that. Um, we also will put the Tonjira um, website links um, in the chat function in case you want to get in contact with Sherlene and Carmel. So now I'll call Marley back um, and you can um, hear about how she's organised the Family Community Summit in Alice Springs. The summit was a huge success um, in engaging local and Aboriginal families to help structure future plans and, and progress. Um, there'll be an opportunity to also ask Marley some questions at the end of her presentation. So over to you, Marley. Thanks, Lisa. Okay, so I would like to start this section by also acknowledging um, the Arunda people who are the traditional owners of the land on which I live and work and to pay my respects to the First Nations people all over um, so-called Australia who looked after this vast land for tens of thousands of years before colonisation. And it's really special to have this opportunity to speak during NAIDOC week. Um, and NAIDOC week is just such a great opportunity for all of us to listen to First Nations voices and to learn from First Nation, Nations knowledge um, systems and connections. So I am going to talk about the successful Family and Community Summit, which was held by Child Friendly Alice. But I'll start by giving a brief explanation about what Child Friendly Alice is. So we're a community collaboration of the service sector um, dedicated to ensuring every child has the best possible start in life to grow up healthy and strong. There is a particular focus on pre-birth to five-year-olds uh, and the group includes government, community organisations um, and individuals working together. So we have a collaborative approach to assessing and addressing the issues faced by children and families in our springs. And what we know is that services working in silos, um, sorry, cause families to suffer service fatigue um, and that having wraparound services who don't talk to each other actually just mean that children and families aren't being cared for and helped in the way that we really are hoping that our programs, you know, affect people. So Child Friendly Alice's governance structure, we have an advisory group which regularly meets throughout the year. We have working groups made up from different organisations who are able to focus on particular areas that need addressing. So this includes transport, um, food security, workforce development, early learning and some others. Uh, and we also have a backbone that meets fortnightly to ensure that the work is progressing and adapting as needed. So in 2019, Child Friendly Alice released this community profile, which um, the cover is on the next slide. and that. Uh, was a collection of a thousand voices throughout the community, including children um, and AEDC data. And that's framed around the erasy areas of wellbeing. And it's all about people's perception um, and their lives in Alice Springs. So this is really what our work is motivated from. So what has become really clear is that we're missing Aboriginal voice in the leadership and governance um, and therefore decision making in Child Friendly Alice, and that we can't proceed without it. So through um, all of us generating ideas to promote community engagement, we figured we had the resources to host an event um, unlike any that we'd seen before, which was the Child and Family Community Summit, sorry, Family and Community Summit, which we did encourage um, people to bring their zero to five-year-old children. And it was by Aboriginal people for Aboriginal people. So when we were planning the summit, what we decided to do was to get um, Aboriginal employees who weren't already necessarily connected to Child Friendly Alice but we thought would have the capacity to be involved um, to come and meet up fortnightly and then weekly and so we felt it was really important to have Aboriginal people to create the event because it would just make a much safer environment for community members to come feel like they could be comfortable um, and speak their truths so we held the event in National Children's Week, which the ongoing theme is Stronger Families, Stronger Communities. And that's just so relevant to all of the work that we're doing. So in the first meeting, um, 
we thought it was really important to explain to the employees what collective impact is, so that it's essentially about working together to produce the best outcomes. Uh, we explained a racy so that children deserve to be loved and safe, to be mentally and physically well, to have basics like enough food or a place to live, to learn well at school, to join in society, and to have a strong sense of belonging to their culture. Um, we also explained child-friendly hours, and what we could really bring people to understand is that, you know, a racy, collective impact, child-friendly Alice, they're all big concepts, but broken down, it is how people want to work and it's how people live. So in the first meeting, the questions that we really decided um, needed to be answered were, who should come to the summit? How do we get them there? What do we tell them? What do we ask them? How do we tell people about child-friendly Alice? And how do we host the event? So do we have stations? Do we have a facilitator for the whole day? Should we be having panel discussions? So this was something that was really talked through with a big um, mix of people from all different organisations. And so as we started making these decisions, we decided the best thing to do would be to front load potential attendees. So we had a brochure on the next slide. Um, oh, sorry, just the next one. So we had. Um, all different information that went out. So there was um, a brochure that explained uh, Child Friendly Alice and a RACI. And we put up a whole lot of information. Um, so posters and flyers throughout the community. We stuck them in shops. We took them to clinics. We had organisations pass them around and we rolled them out on social media because we wanted people who were coming to the event to really understand what we were asking them to do and what we wanted them, what knowledge we wanted them to come with so that it wasn't um, a completely new concept to them and that actually worked really well. So the group decided um, that we'd have a welcome to country and a smoking ceremony. So we approached uh, a couple of different Aboriginal organisations to offer that service um, and we did get some people to come and do that. For entertainment we had a local radio station, um, community radio 8CCC who came, they provided the equipment, the sound equipment and they also stayed through the day and had a background playlist, which was amazing and not something that we'd asked for, but was really valued. We also had some rappers, um, some young fellows who came from Urara College. And we had lunch catered, Food Bank SA came and gave away food packs. Um, the Beanie Festival donated some hats and scarves. And in terms of framing the day, people really did understand the Eracy Nest, the way that it worked in services, how people lived. So it actually was a pretty simple decision to split the stations um, through the nest areas. And then we developed a framework, so the next slide, to ensure whatever group people went to, they could sort of engage quite meaningfully with that section. So there was, you know, the six sections for the framework. So we had two employees at each station who work in the relevant um, area. We had a script developed from this framework. Um, so the next slide, is an example of the loved and safe station script. So we had three um, main questions. So we had strengths, weaknesses, and challenges that people face in that area with the service system. So what we really needed to consider was what the areas are, what we're trying to find out from them, um, get insight into what people think and really know about the services provided. If people are accessing the services they need, whether the services were making an impact or a difference, our services and programs adding value. We wanted to bring information to people about what is happening in the community, what the services are doing um, and what we're missing. So, and any barriers that people were facing accessing those services. So, oh, and we also, you know, really importantly, as well as the challenges, we wanted to know the success stories. So what people valued, where people felt valued, and what services they thought needed to be replicated in some way to make more services that valuable. So some of the real challenges and layers to the discussions that we had before the event were how to get people to engage and participate authentically rather than us leading them towards answers. Um, and there was some hesitation with, you know, it's really exciting to host events like this, but we don't want uh, Aboriginal employees and community members to only be engaging in events. We want them to be part of the 
structure and the framework and the groundwork um, of the services to make sure that we are actually reflective in our practices of what people are saying and wanting. So we also wanted to make it really clear that whilst we were getting people to come to this event, that we wanted to continue the conversation and that it was a real invitation to join in with the work um, and that we would support people however they needed to be to come and partner with us and to come on the journey with us to progress further. So with the station, so um, the staff had this framework, so they had all the questions and things framed up for them. They had um, a pack which had the area of wellbeing logo and then just some visual descriptive words for really what that area meant or means. Um, and then we had some posters and different ways of collecting feedback. So the three um, sections for strength, weakness and challenges, we had them recorded on a big tree, which I believe is on the next slide. Um, so we created a tree with the six different, six branches. Oh, sorry, this is an example of the poster with the three questions that were at each station. Um, so for identity and culture, there's a challenge question, a strength question, a weakness, and they were recorded on either leaves to go onto the trees. Um, the challenges were recorded onto storm clouds to go behind the tree, and the weaknesses were recorded onto puzzle pieces, which went on the ground and could all link up to show um, just like more of a visual way for people to understand what they were asking for and so for services you know in all of our feedback and summaries that it was really simple and clear to see three separate sections. Um, so what we sort of decided afterwards was we needed to figure out what to do with the feedback, um, what to do with the information that we have gathered, how we can use it to affect change um, so they are, you know, big questions that we're grappling with, but that I think this summit really helped us to get some answers to. We do have um, some progression in place. We do have some ideas of where we're going to go from here. Um, and it was, it was a really meaningfully, uh, you know, people really were interested on the day. We did have a lot of meaningful discussions. We had some really deep discussions. People have continued to want to follow up on it. We are hosting another event for National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Children's Day, which is on the 4th of August. So we're hoping um, to have a similar sort of framework, but not to be asking the same questions again. We will be wanting to move forward. Um, we have created a summary of feedback document. The feedback has been collated um, and submitted to the Northern Territory Department of Education for the Education Engagement Strategy. Some of the Child Friendly Alice Summit Planning Group met with Anne Hollands, who's the National Children's Commissioner. Um, her team provided feedback. Uh, they're doing a project called Keeping Kids Safe and Well, Your Voices, and it's a national consultation project. So we did pass on all of our feedback from the summit to them. Um, and we do feel like there are some you know, further ways that we can engage on a higher level with this feedback, but also that there's a way to keep the community members involved. So what we always kept in mind was that the purpose of the day was to engage the Aboriginal community um, and families who have not had a voice for too long in too many places, and that we specifically wanted to engage with local Aboriginal families. So people with lived experience, and we wanted the day to be planned by people with lived experience, because it doesn't make sense to make plans for the future for local Aboriginal people without local Aboriginal people. So I believe that there's going to be a video next that's just a quick summary um, of the summit. And yeah, then I'm open for questions. Child Friendly Alice is the idea that if everyone works together for children and their families, every child in Alice Springs will have the best possible start in life to grow up healthy, happy and strong. It's about working together and sharing the same goals. Currently there are around 40 organisations involved, all of them with a focus on childhood wellbeing. Organisations in Alice Springs work hard to deliver their programs and help the individual families and people they work with, but we need to work together to make sure links between our work is shown and any gaps are filled. We know there is no point doing this work alone and we know that Child Friendly Alice is missing Aboriginal voice. 
We cannot make plans for the programs we deliver and for the future without including the people the programs are being made for. Thanks, Marley. Um, more um, things through the questions and chat box saying, I love these ideas. They're amazing. Um, can we please have one in Darwin? <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe, like, I, to me, it just sounds like it's the, you've covered all bases in this. Like, how long did it actually take to, to facilitate to get to that, actually, to, to actually get to the summit day? What was the we actually time? only had, um, I, I believe it was about two and a half months. It was quite a quick turnaround because when we realised we were coming up to National Families Week, we just thought that was such a perfect day to have it. And I don't know, I think we were a bit lucky with the people um, that were part of the planning group and that everybody was really on board with all of the ideas that came up. But it was a pretty seamless process. Like when once we had you know, quite a few to-do lists and we had the framework for the day, um, the discussions were just really simple. We just could figure out everything else um, pretty flawlessly. Yeah, okay. Um, got another interesting question. Someone says, I really wanted to participate. However, I feel like it's really hard to sometimes contact the Indigenous community. What's the best way for other people to get involved or is there opportunity? with Child Friendly Alice or with sort of the Aboriginal community? So I guess um, Child Friendly Alice, we absolutely welcome people to be involved. We It is a whole of community approach. We want everybody to understand how important it is to be looking after, you know, children and particularly kids zero to five. That sets them up for life. Um, mm. We do have a Facebook. We have a website. So childfriendlyalice.org.au or Child Friendly Alice on Facebook. So please get in touch via them. Um, and in terms of engagement with Aboriginal community, I think that's something that actually everybody finds to be the big hard question. Um, so mm -hmm. I think place-based is really important. I think if you can just continue to try to contact the people in your own area, that is the most meaningful way to engage. Yeah. Okay, and I've just got someone saying, wonderful presentation. How would you sum up the main findings so so far to date? So I think there wasn't anything that came out of the summit that was um, that nobody has ever heard before. I think there are, you know, we did ask people also, aside from all of the other feedback they collected, to just sum up the three main points that they talked about on the day. The biggest thing that we continue to come back to is cultural competency. So services to be safe places, I think, again, place-based resources are the most um, sort of important way. And that's the way to make people feel the most comfortable, the way to get people engaged. It is to make sure that the people who work in the industry, in, in, sorry, in the services, in schools, in health, understand the community that they are working in, rather than a broad approach, um, you know, over all of Australia, because that's just not realistic that's not how people live we are different groups yeah mm. um and i'm definitely and i just um saying that we're running out of time but um in summary some of the feedback from the audience is that it should be mirrored across the country it's such a um, giving local mobs a say and there's people from brisbane all over the place going how can we get in contact with you how can we do this how can we start this um so i yeah, guess I you're saying Absolutely happy to um, to talk to anybody who wants, you know, to, to create anything like this. I think if you go into organising something like this with an authentic want to be engaging Aboriginal people and you really authentically want to listen to their voices and that you are committed to making changes, then that's how you draw people in. Mm. And that, you know, often that's hard for people who are working, you know, just at... at um, a service delivery level but I think that if you're really passionate about it and you really can you know I'm happy to to provide the feedback that we had I think if you have a little bit of background behind you it is it's not too hard to talk to the management in your organizations to say this is something that we could really lean into yeah I guess you need people who are leaders like 
yourself and Charlene and Carmel to say, we can do this. And and I guess what's also coming across is just your energy and your passion. Um, and I, you so know, I think, I think it is important to have people who are committed to it. But I think the other thing is that, you know, especially with the Erasing Nest, it's something that everybody can access. It's not hard to grasp the concepts of it when you just have a bit of an explanation for it, even with collective impact, it actually just means working together and you can't really argue with it. Um, so it's, I don't think it would be that hard to get people uh, involved and interested in projects um, if you just have a little bit of a framework like that for them. Absolutely. Look, I'm sorry that we've run out of time, um, but we'll also, and hopefully we won't overwhelm um, Charlene and Carmel and Marley oh, yeah. with emails, but we will provide their contact details. Um, so I guess I'll just, um, I'll say goodbye to you, Marley, and thank you so much for um, being part of the webinar. I think a way to summarise our speakers today in just one word is inspiring. Um, I want to thank everyone for being part of this webinar today. Um, along with NAPCAM, we invite you all to take this opportunity to engage in a genuine commitment to walk alongside Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations of peoples and their communities, not just as part of NAIDOT week, but every week. And to all our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations and peoples and their communities, NAPCAM pledges a commitment to walk alongside you to create stronger communities that can protect and nurture your families and children. We acknowledge the suffering, past and present, and we value your cultural wisdom and we will listen to your voices. Um, the webinar will be on our website, probably not till next week sometime. Happy NAIDOT week, everyone. And thank you so much for giving us your time and joining us today. Thanks again. Bye-bye.